So I think we all know, or at least assume, that hierarchies underlie processing across domains. Um, in the brain, in perception. We, are, we know much about the visual hierarchy. And hierarchy, I mean sort of the visual bottom-up hierarchy where early representations are very local, uh, see a very small part of the world, typically defined as the receptive field of a single neuron. And as we go up along the visual hierarchy, which is sort of go forward, um, let's say in the ventral stream of the visual processing hierarchy, uh, we go to processing of larger and larger entities, more abstract entities, and at the level of single neurons, uh, it means that single neurons are activated by a larger portion of the, <coughs> of the visual field and by more abstract concepts, sometimes even symbolic concepts, uh, typically those that make a difference to us in the world, sort of more ecologically meaning uh, stimuli. Uh, even though we are much more aware of the visual hierarchy, it's, I think, quite well agreed that the auditory processing is also hierarchical, even though we know much less about this hierarchy. So we know quite a lot about the early representations, about the sort of uh, uh, near the sense organs of the auditory processing. We know a lot. We know a lot to the extent that we can produce sort of um, um, cochlea, uh, synthetic cochlea that, you know, that can replace what's going on at the level uh, of single receptors at the level of the ear, but we know much less about higher levels of this hierarchy, even though I think we assume we have less evidence for it that higher level representations also probably are uh, uh, reflected at the level of single neurons are kind of more abstract broader, and broader in auditory terms would be sensitive to longer time constants, sensitive to a broader spectrum. So compared with the uh, early representations, which are very sensitive to a specific range of stimuli uh, in the spectral domain, as we go higher, uh, neurons are gradually more sensitive to increasingly uh, larger areas within the spectrum. There's also evidence that they are, as we go higher in the hierarchy, neurons are increasingly more sensitive to longer and longer time constants. What I'd like to talk about today is how this hierarchy is related to learning and skill acquisition. And what I'd like to say is that even though typically, traditionally, we think about tasks as they are related to the kind of processing that needs to be conducted and to the stimuli that they involved. So typically, let's say traditionally, we think about uh, I don't know, orientation discrimination, two-tone frequency discrimination as low-level tasks because they involve uh, simple discriminations which along a dimension that is well sorted out already in the peripheral aspect in the low level early stages of the processing hierarchy. So we have to do something that is already processed early along the hierarchical system. Compared to high level tasks, let's say, I don't know, what are high level tasks? Tasks that uh, require some kind of combinations maybe with uh, say, uh, larger stimuli, more abstract stimuli, some kind of complex processing. Uh, one of these examples could be reading, for instance. Reading requires combining of lots, so, so, lots of information, visual, auditory knowledge about language, and we do it serially, and then we combine. I'll give you more examples about that. What I'd like to say today is that Orientation discrimination is not low level and reading is not high level. What really makes the difference between the level of tasks that are processes is the amount of experience that we have with them. So when we are novice, tasks are high level. When we are experts, tasks in many ways are low level. Um, how can that be possible? Because with practice, what makes us experts is not that we do the same but much faster, we actually switch strategy. And this switch is typically implicit and we are not really much aware of it. And it's implemented by changing the underlying neural circuitry that is sort of uh, um, the neural circuitry that underlies task processing. So that with practice, 
rather than performing tasks at high level, high areas of the, let's say, of the cortex, we can gradually perform them with different areas, with, let's say, areas of expertise. How can we manage to do that? How do we switch the strategy? Um, so in a way, we kind of backsource the processing of the task. How do we manage to do that? Well, a prerequisition for that is that there are some regularities in the tasks that we perform. And we have to have regularities, and we have to be able to detect these regularities and use them. When these regularities are present, and actually such regularities, I'll give you what such is, many exa or several examples, uh, is something that denotes our environment, because if we think about it, what really enables us to perform well in the environment, in spite of being pretty slow processes, is that our environment is really, really far from being random. Our environment is well predicted if you're well experienced with the specific things that you need to perform. But task relies on specific regularities, and what we have to detect are the regularities that are relevant for task performance, and, we, and the idea is that we store them, and we store them at back areas of our brain. So we have to be able to detect these regularities, we store them, and then gradually we rely on these regularities, these schemes to an extent, being stored in these areas, being retrieved by specific uh, situations, and that allows us to perform the task in a different way, which does not rely to a large extent on online processing with which we are pretty poor. And it is very important, and this is, I think, a, a, a crucial distinction, that it's not just that we repeat something many, many times, so something is kind of strengthened by repetition. The crux of it is that this gradual back sourcing is top to, well, top backwards, because we have to figure out what is the thing that is relevant for task performance? It's not just a repetition, because the schemes have to be set at a level which utilizes the regularities that can serve for task performance. For instance, if we just go to, uh, if we just look at the letters, and the same letters appear many times, it is important to, well, some small changes make a difference between two letters. Other changes are not relevant at all. So we have to store the uh, template at a level which is not just template repetition, but figures out something about the task. You know, let's, before I get into my study, let me give you just a feeling for it. This is, sounds like a stupid example, but you know, just to wake you up a little, to get you a bit more active at this challenging time of the day. This is my interpretation of your eyes. <laughs> so let's get you a bit more active. Um, let me give you a challenging task, a, a, an addition task, okay? Uh, please add, in your favorite language, it does make a difference, uh, 34 plus 97. Please do that and, and, and keep, and don't say anything. <laughs> don't say anything too much, okay? Um, is this a challenging task? Is this a cognitive task? Are you expert in this task? So the thing is, you're not completely novice, you're not experts, because you had to do the math, you had to do the uh, calculation. It was a serial thing because I made it more challenging because you had to add the digit there. So you know what to do, you know to apply the algorithm, but you're not experts. But I did make you experts. Now let me ask you again, what was the question? 34 plus 97. In your favorite language, right? <laughs> so the 131 in language does make a difference, and that's part of the point. It's about specifics, you know. We all remember it. We can do that in the language we're familiar with, even though it's an abstract, right? An abstract. No, it's nothing is abstract in our mind, I think. It's not. It's a little sad, but this is it. So now you're expert, right? to this very minute thing, which is 97 plus 34, because you didn't have to calculate, you could just retrieve. And this says many things, because if I ask you now, what is 48 plus, I don't know, 86? You're not expert to that, okay? You become expert to something which is very specific. For this specific item, you can just retrieve. We all know to do this math, but we're still limited by the fact that once you have to calculate, we're very slow. I will give the example in a simple task that I've been working on a lot. It's two-tone discrimination, also about reading. 
what I'll try to convince you with is that expert readers don't need to read. If you have a difficulty in expertise acquisition, it's called, in this, in this task, it's called dyslexia, and the problem is that you're not expert, you actually have to read. This is a serial task, because you actually have to do the task. You're not an expert in learning the regularities that allow you to be an expert that retrieves rather than calculates. That's what I'd like to convince you with. And the other thing is that what makes us being able to retrieve, that we have a mechanism for storing the relevant representations at this part of the brain called auditory cortices, visual cortices, meaning the expert perceives the non-expert calculates. So the difference is, I mean, a strong version of this concept is that the difference between cognition and perception is the degree of expertise of the performer. If you're an expert, you perceive. And this goes to chess masters, and this goes for, and, and this is an expertise most of us do not have, even though we know some of it. So we have some very basic schemes. What is the scheme of chess that we all have? The opening arrangement, right? We can all do that. We are very good at that, even if we just had one. Give you an example. But, but most of us are not experts. It's much more than that. The task I'll be using is, well, to some extent, you might find it offensive <laughs> because it's so simple. But it's been so challenging for us to figure out what's going on. It's embarrassing. Here's the task. You hear, this is it. You heard two tones. They're pure tones. And the only thing the person has to answer is which tone is higher. And so it's a pitch discrimination task. It's considered a low-level task. It's traditionally been presented as very low level. We want to say, I'd like to say, that what makes it high level or low level depends on how, and how much of an expert you are. And I can make you an expert to something very simple in four minutes, even less. But I'll make you an expert to something which is not, perhaps not very useful, very useful for me, but not outside this context. And let me illustrate that. So the task is, which tone is higher? And I'll present several trials in sequence and ask yourself, and answer to yourself, which of each of two tone pairs is higher? You know, please don't look at the, because it says the answer. OK? Now I'll give you five more pairs. Do the same. Please don't look. OK? For those of you who did not, who, you know, were very obedient and did not look at the illustration, how many are there? OK, oh, wow. Are you so obedient or you're not decent? <laughs> OK. Um, what was the difference between the two sets? No, now you look. OK. So the thing is that this is something we do in the lab. And people do when we measure their thresholds. And I'll show you the thresholds in these two conditions. And then we ask them, was there a difference between these two things? I say, we don't think so. And we say, yeah, there was a difference. In one of these sets, right, one of the stimuli was always this. Sorry. One of the. Should you wait, Mr. Fine? Okay. Okay. Uh, so one of these stats has exactly the same tone repeating across trials. And we're saying, OK, one is like this. Which is the one? Guess. And it's really chance level guessing. So people don't get what's going on, because when they actually do the task, they do the task. If I ask you to figure out which tone is the same, then maybe you can do that. But this is not what people think about when they do the task. And when they do the task, they're not aware of what's going on. But if you look at their thresholds, they're hugely different, OK? So when there's nothing repeated, when there's nothing repeated, they have about 10% threshold. I'm sorry. I'll try another one. Um, 
So when there's nothing repeated, the threshold is about 10%. When the reference is repeated first, so there's 1,000 hertz, which is the first tone of each trial, and then the overall thresholds are about 1%. So it's about, well, it depends across individuals, it's very, very robust effect. It's about five to 10 folds difference, namely the frequency difference needed to attain 80% correct hugely different whether there's a reference which is repeated or not. And I'm, I, I, I have to say, note, that if you detect the reference, even though implicitly it doesn't tell you the right answer, because the reference could be either lower or higher. So it's not that detecting the reference is equal to, aha, uh -huh, high or low. What you can detect is, in a way, something that can change the mode that you perform the task. Because if, at least implicitly, you get that something whether it's the actually repeated reference or the average of the frequencies, we'll get to it in a minute, is reliably repeated as the first tone, you can rather than refer, you know, actually compare the first two tones, you can compare the second tone to some kind of an internal reference. I'd like to say to comparing to an internal reference changes the mode you perform the task dramatically. You can keep the reference back in an auditory stage, and then actually comparing to this reference, to this internal reference, is like an identification. It's like I identify Daphna because I have somewhere a representation of Daphna, and when I'm stimulated with Daphna stimulus, I can compare it with something which is not an online comparison. It's part of the bottom-up comparison as a consequence of my top-down learning of what the task is, okay? so. This means that in order for us to detect the presence of a repeated reference, we probably always seek for some kind of regularity. How can we know there is a regularity and utilize it in this case, unless we systematically seek for regularities and utilize that in some way? This means that even when there's no repeated reference, we do something that is consistently looking for what's going on, what's the general statistics of the task. And this is what led for a collaboration <coughs> in a study on this task, on this task, with Jonathan Levinstein and, and, and Ofri. This is another representation of exactly the same task. But now, rather than uh, as a function of time, what we see here is each dot stands for a single trial. So the single trial is represented as frequency of the first tone, frequency of the second tone, okay, which means the diagonal is the cases where the frequency of the first and second tone are exactly the same. In these studies, we don't cheat the participants, so there's no dot on the diagonal itself. However, if what really makes the task very difficult is the distance between frequency of the first and the second, it means that performance should be quite poor near the diagonal, where the frequencies are both low or both high, and should be much better as we go farther from the diagonal because the frequency difference becomes larger. There is some sense to it, uh, and, and blue dots uh, present correct trials, and red dots present incorrect trials, okay? So let's see whether the blue and the red are, are spread in this manner. Well, there is more red near and more blue far, but there's a really large effect, which is not about the distance from the diagonal, but is about where F1 and F2 are represented. Here there are more reds, here there are more blues, here there are more reds, and here there are more blues. And if you look at the summary statistics, very simple, what is the percent correct in this range? It's 62 across participants, this is 88, and similarly this is 88, and this is 63. That's a huge difference. We can calculate it in JNDs, it's about six to seven times JND regardless of the actual difference in the trial, which is only dictated by the context, or differently speaking, by the statistics of the, uh, of, the, of the experiment. Why is that? How can we explain that? Let's see what happens in this, uh, in this area compared with this area. So what happens in this area is that the two tones are above 1,000 hertz, are above the average, okay? The average is 1,000 hertz. This is the average, and this is the average of the first tone and of the second tone. The two tones are above the average, however, the second tone is higher than the first tone. Here, the, also, the two tones are above the average, but the, second, but the first tone is higher than the second tone. So what we suggested is, okay, 
So if individuals take into account previous statistics, regardless of whether there is regularity or there's no regularity, they always take into account previous statistics. What will happen is, suppose, why is it more important to take the statistics into account? So we reason that it's more important for the first tone. Why? Because you have to retain the first tone until you hear the second tone, which means it has an added noise of the retention, in a way, working memory noise, till the second tone. It's noisier. How can we functionally reduce the noise if we integrate the representation of this tone with our prior? What is the expectation for the frequency? And then we have some kind of representation which is closer to our prior, okay? which is 1,000 hertz. What does it do effectively? It increases the difference between the two tones, makes the tone comparison more easy, and a substantially higher percent correct. However, the same manipulation, which means we get a representation which is a combination of what we actually have and what we predict should be, based on the prior average frequency, means that actually the representation we really compare here is something in between smaller difference, and our percent correct will be substantially smaller, which is what happens. This analysis has a specific prediction, which is that individuals with higher level of noise are expected to put a higher weight on their prior information because it's expected to improve their performance more because that's the whole idea. I have a noisy representation. How can I improve it? By utilizing my prior. If my representation is noisier than that, I'll give a higher weight to my prior. And this is something we'll see that really happens to an extent that you can really predict to what extent an individual will put a weight on the uh, first tone depending on the noise level of this person. So, the idea is that what we can see is that people look for the statistics, they're unaware of this process. This is an automatic process. We think that these statistics can replace the representation, the actual comparison, working memory comparison, which is perhaps done in working memory uh, stages, and be replaced with a representation of the repeated frequency, repeated average, but only when it proves functional. Like in the regularity containing condition, like in the first tone is always repeated in the first representation. This is a prediction, functional prediction, anatomical prediction. It means that the expert will not have the same circuitry that underlies the two tasks or the expert, or I can make you an expert in the two tone discrimination. How can I make you an expert very, very quickly? have the first tone repeated always the same. You'll be an expert. You'll be very good at two-tone discrimination. People sometimes call it learning. We don't think it's learning because you're very good only in this condition. Then you do something else, and it doesn't make you good. But we predict that in this situation, the underlying circuitry will use less of working memory, and we rely more on areas, auditory cortices, that detect these regularities. Okay? And this is what we did in the magnet. So what we did, we asked people to do this task. Several blocks were like this, there was nothing repeated. Several blocks were, there's something, there's the same tone repeated, actually the same two tasks, however we interleaved it. Several blocks like this, like this, like this, like this, and then we collected and did the subtraction and see, okay, what do we see in the brain? So this is how we orchestrated. So there's several blocks with no reference, with reference, no reference, with reference. As you can see, there's nothing that demarcates. OK, now we're switching, now we're switching. And people didn't notice that there was a switch at any stage. They were coming for a set of uh, trial, of a set of trials, um, about 200 trials, and did not, do, did not notice the switch. If you look at where, which areas are activated, uh, compared by any of these conditions, compared to just stress, so we see this is left auditory cortex, this is right auditory cortex, and what we see here is a bundle of activities. Note that it's quite specific to the left hemisphere. If it rings a bell with language, it should, because I will, uh, towards the end, I will show you how it's quite language-related language areas, but uh, we can see this part is like sensory motor, which is probably related to the fact that participants just pressed first, second, okay, so they pressed with their right hand. You expect activity in the left part, sort of uh, uh, tactile sensory motor, this part. But here are areas that are related to working memory, okay, frontal and parietal areas related to working memory, particularly auditory working memory. And we were asking whether there will be a difference in the activity of these areas when we compare 
no regularity, with regularity, exactly the same task. Performers do not notice that there is a difference. Will there be a difference? And in what direction? And of course, we predicted that when there is regularity, these areas will be less activated. Okay? Why? Because part of the task is actually funneled backwards so that it can be retrieved by the representation of the repeated reference of the average, which is actually useful only when there is regularity, this simple regularity that I noted. Okay? So what we did is compare, we just did a contrast, uh, contrast which areas are activated more when there's no reference compared with reference, so we just collected these areas versus these areas, and these were the areas that we found, condition. The level of difficulty of the two tasks was equated because we made the physical difference larger when there is regularity, and we found a pattern that is roughly what we would have predicted given that we're looking for working memory areas. These areas, this is also Broca, for who uh, sort of similar to Broca, uh, don't think I will elaborate much on that. And these are two sort of frontal, parietal, well-known working memory network. This is a premotor area also associated with the working memory network. So we see that even though you perform something which is the same to the participant, doesn't consciously, um, we see a difference in the activity of working memory. And the other thing we looked at is what happened as you perform the task. You have several trials like this, several like this, several like this, what happens? When we look at the different blocks in the reference, there's a regularity that we see the first, second, third, there's improvement. Then there's a different block, different type of regularity. Oops, performance drops. Three blocks in a row, the same kind of regularity, performance improve. You switch it, performance drops, etc. So what we find is performance improve whenever you're the same regularity. You mixed the statistics because you introduce different trials, performance drops, it improves, performance drops. So there's a condition-specific improvement, which is behavioral. And if we look at what happens, what is the contrast between the beginning and the end? When there's no regularity, we find no contrast. Okay? We find no change. When there is regularity, we find a change that is limited to these two areas. High level auditory area, for which there's additional evidence that is sensitive to statistics of auditory stimuli, where we think in a way there's some sort of scheme was represented during the assessment, gradually during the assessment. And this parietal area, our best interpretation is that it has to do with managing this representation. Managing is admittedly a pretty blurred word at this point. What we were really interested in, there's evidence, but only for the regularity containing condition, that there's changes in auditory areas, which we interpret as indicating that some part of the sort of task was switched to relying on scheme very simple scheme in this case that is represented here, very simple, so it's produced quickly. So the idea is that, just to summarize what I've been trying to say, is that practice, particularly practice with regularity, switches the underlying circuitry to something that relies, in this case, so sort of on high-level auditory representations that are pretty specific to the regularities that were useful. And I think that this is a very basic mechanism for expertise. We have to detect regularities. It's a very basic tool for uh, attaining expert level performance. Uh, kind of back source. When we manage to detect the regularities and see that our predictions are effective, they're good. We predicted something, it was verified, and then we can rely on these representations and we become expert. The last part. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, the last few minutes uh, will be dictated to a case where this mechanism fails, where you practice. Practice doesn't make you perfect because you fail to acquire the regularities that underlie the task. And the task is reading, and the case is dyslexia, and dyslexics have a long, they have a difficulty in reading. Of course, they improve with practice, but they never become experts. The big debate in dyslexia at the moment, in the last 20 years, is whether it's specific to language related tasks, because reading is about alphabet, is about sequences of sounds, not just about pictures, and whether it is about the basic representations or access to these representations. What we propose is that it's not specific to speech sounds, and mainly that this is the wrong way of looking at it. It's not representations versus non-representations because this assumes that there's context-free 
that perception is context-free. We don't think it's like there's receptive field and then beyond receptive field. Now, we don't think that there's something which is context-free in perception, and we think that the problem is that the context is not well integrated in dyslexia, as I will show you. And we did this simply, we think it's about language, but language is all about detecting regularities in sound sequences. And dyslexics have difficulties in, in detecting these regularities. And what we can show here is this is the same thing. This is thresholds of performance of teenagers. No regularity, with regularity. Teenagers, they have poorer performance, but the regularity sensitivity is very similar. However, when you look at dyslexics, they do poorly, but as controls when there's no regularity and you have to work your way through the tones and you have to compare them, retain them, compare them, etc. but they cannot get the benefit of relying on the regularity. And if you look at exactly the same representations that I showed you before, okay, there's F1, F2, these are the, two, the, the various, these are all the same distance, they're all the same level of absolute difficulty between, difference between F1 and F2, and this is control, we can see that they perform even worse here, 50 at chance level, where the context is in damages performance because integrating predictions is bad for you. Here is where integrating prediction, the average, is good for you. There's a huge difference in performance. This is the control. When we do the same with dyslexics, the same uh, task, we see they do much worse when prediction helps you. Okay? These are the yellow areas, 68, 78 compared with above 90 for controls. But here, when prediction actually undermines your performance because predictions are wrong because it goes contra to what you would have expected, they actually perform somewhat better than controls. Okay, so the idea is that they are not as effective in utilizing regularity. And this means, I will skip this. This means that they do not optimize. They're a little noisier, so they should have used regularity more because they could have benefited more from utilizing predictions, they utilize them less, and they're really suboptimal in how they utilize performance. And this, this is a detail that doesn't really matter. Two more things I'd like to say very, very briefly. So where is it that they don't well integrate? Where is it they don't compare? What is it? So performance was not sufficiently useful just to tell what's wrong in the sort of uh, prediction integration mechanism. Uh, we used ERPs. Basically, there's an ERP component that is sensitive to the statistics of the experiment. This is this ERP component. It's called P2. It's a, 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 a something produced by the auditory cortex in a general sense. And what we can see is that I don't want, I don't have, to, I want to, I don't have time to uh, get into the details where controls, this is something that says, aha, when we compare the conditions that gets you better with the conditions that do not get you better because of sound statistics, control discriminate, but dyslexics do not. What's important is that this recording had been conducted when participants were looking at a silent movie. So it was automatic. They were not performing actively the task. It was obtained after the first tone. This is the response to the first tone. This is the response to the second tone. There's a difference. Dyslexics do not have a difference. Which means that there's an automatic sensitivity that tracks the, how close a stimulus, is to, a stimulus is to the average statistics. Controls have it. They have it even when they do not perform the task. But here the same stimuli. And dyslexics, automatic process of tracking this sound statistics is impaired. Uh, so we can track it to impaired mechanism. And this interpretation actually gives a very coherent uh, picture with what people have demonstrated for dyslexia. And this is taken from the Hans book, and he studies reading in the brain. This is kind of a caricature for which areas are activated when you're actually reading, let's say, a known, a known word. And it's, again, similar to the area I've been showing you, sort of frontal area. A posterior area that is involved in both the visual and auditory aspects. This is called the visual word form area, more sensitive to known words. This is the pattern of the expert. This is the pattern of dyslexics. The pattern of dyslexics, sort of the signature, signature is probably an overstatement, but the signature is kind of overactivity of the frontal areas that actually do the online calculation and less of a back sourcing 
to expert related to areas that are gradually formed with expertise because the schemes of words and word consistencies like morphology, etc., are sort of backsourced uh, in the expert, but they're not backsourced there, so we don't see the expert areas. This is a process that happens in the general population in the first three years of learning, of reading acquisition, but doesn't happen effectively in dyslexics. And we can mark it also behaviorally. This is my last slide. We can mark it also behaviorally. If we look at what is the marker of the expertise, is that the number of computations that need to be performed does not affect your processing, okay? You're parallel with the number because you don't actually perform them because you retrieve. This is something we see for experts as a function of the length of the word, okay? We look at RT to words that are short, longer, longer, and very long. And if you're just beginning reader, the longer the word is, the longer it takes you until you can actually read it. If you're in the second grade, this uh, slope decreases, third grade, you're almost an expert, and sl this slope really decreases, not because you read faster. You need just very few cues to actually retrieve. The this is only true for known words. This, this does unknown words, of course, you become a novice again. Okay? This is for the items that you've been practicing. This is the case for dyslexia. Okay? <coughs> Dyslexics, they do somewhat better than really beginners, but the main crucial thing is that they as, and this is just closing what I started to say, they actually have to read. Meaning they have to do the process of the alphabet, deciphering the alphabet, which the expert can skip because presumably these schemes are well ingrained because of detecting the irregularities that enable to uh, store the schemes by the informative aspects of the task. Conclusion. So regularity detection is the main tool of the cortex to attain expert level performance via back sourcing backwards along the hierarchies from those that are high level and decipher what the task is to those that actually retain the details that need to be addressed. When you receive an input, the outcome is back sourcing, learned schemes, dyslexics benefit from recent stimuli is impaired, and hence they have difficulties in back sourcing, becoming experts. So, sorry, I'm not your test masters, unless you ask me. Um, thank you. wondering, I mean, you, you, when you uh, were detecting regularities in your case where the first stimulus was constant, you had to keep this in working memory for the time for comparison with the second stimulus. Now, do you think that this is uh, an essential part? Uh, that is, if you were to use sort of, it's hard to do this with an aud in the auditory domain, but let's say in the visual domain, in which one stimulus was constant and the other would be changing. You would also get a benefit, I presume, of the fact that you have a, a repetition of the first stimulus, but you don't have this issue of having to retain something in memory and comparison. So I'm wondering if this uh, sort of regularity detection is relevant mostly for working memory, or is this something that you think that's also relevant for the perceptual side, per se? I, I, I think, in, I think. With regards to reading, does that, I mean, when you read a word, I guess that if you're sort of a, a novice, you have to read this, as you said, letter by letter. Maybe there's also working memory aspect there as well, that you have to keep that in mind. And, and I, I, it's, it's relevant a, as well. It's a question that, of course, you know, I'm, I came uh, to reading from the visual variety, so of course it's a question that. that asked a lot, I think that in both, to some extent, what happens is in a way a chunk, sort of ch scheme forming is like chunking. And one could say there's temporal chunking and there's spatial chunking. And temporal chunking, you could do temporal chunking in the visual modality. So we had the, uh, the visual analog of these tasks to dyslexics and they have a difficulty in the temporal chunking. I think it's not about specifically about auditory stimuli, but about temporal chunking, which I think is related to the uh, motor system, which is about motor schemes. And I think motor schemes is about our ability to hold working memory, because this is something we have to be able to internally reproduce compared with some. So this is about chunking, temporal chunking. And I think this part is impaired in dyslexia. And I think there's spatial chunking, which is about scene analysis. And I think. There are many things that are similar, but if you look at the level of a single participant, they're not correlated. Your ability to sort of chunk spatially and chunk temporally. So these are tasks. So we've done all sorts of manipulations of visual tasks, and we can see that. So I think this is a division with, which is related to different systems that underlie the same concept, but in somewhat of a different way. 
my first question is a follow-up on your point. I don't understand why this would be any different in the visual system. If you compare, for example, two orientations, you would have exactly the same memory issues. You would have exactly the same regular. Exactly. Issues. You could do this simultaneously. So we did. But what you we did. Actually, sounds simultaneously. So if the experiment. It's a different. Okay. So in the auditory modality, in a way, we have one dimension for in, in the input versus. X, Y in the visual modality, and we have about sort of uh, uh, consistently a different number of, of input lines. But we could do the visual analog of serial visual stuff, and we get very similar results. And musicians, this is a study, uh, thank you for almost asking. So, <laughs> so musicians are really better in serial comparisons in the visual domain, but as long as they're serial and not when they're parallel. So you could do it. It's not about the actual stimuli, but whether you have to retain in time, and there's something about time that is across modalities, I think. So can I have my real question now? The <laughs> last question. Remember we have a coffee break. I'll, I'll make it quick. Yeah. So it sounded like you wanted to say the stimuli either have regularity or they don't have re regularity. No, we always, always assume that they have regularity. Well, there is always regularity. Like you're staying within that 1,000 uh, hertz range, right? That's a regularity. My question was, can subjects distinguish between these different levels of regularity? So you, you tested, or at least you showed here, only the first stimulus repeating. Of course, also the second could be repeating. You know, we tried to. Uh, do they? Do they? Can they cover? I think they can. I think they have. I think. I think they have, and this has to do with. This is my interpretation of the parietal activity. So I kind of presented two extremes, but we can never do something that has no regularity of, at all, right? Even though we had some uh, uh, paradigms that I didn't talk about that where predictions are kind of counteracted. So this may. So I think that participants have. Uh, a, a, let's say parameter which evaluates the reliability of their prediction, and that's sort of integrated into that. And I think that when your predictions are very reliable, you get a change in the activity of the parietal networks that has to do with the reliability, with your estimation of how your prediction is reliable within this context, which has to do with to what extent you integrate it. It's how noisy you are compared with how reliable your prediction is. Okay, let's thank you Good afternoon. Uh, it's going to be a, a little bit of a change of uh, style and pace because I'm, I believe I be, be belong to the other part of the hierarchy. <laughs> of, uh, so I'm actually going to start from really try to convince you that uh, hierarchies are a very general phenomena which uh, follows from what we call first principles in some sense. I mean, uh, so I believe they, they occur in biology not only in vision, not only in reading, and not only in uh, essentially any task that we have to perform, but there is some sort of duality even between what we call sensory hierarchies or perceptual hierarchies and um, planning hierarchies, which is something else. I mean, so behavior and perception are in some sense coupled and it all follows, and actually those hierarchies that are what we now call sensory or perception hierarchies are reflected not only in, in cognitive tasks like the things that Mirab talked about, like reading, uh, visual tasks and so on, but also in uh, the anatomy of, of the brain. And actually I believe that the same principles can explain uh, uh, the anatomy, I mean, in terms of the layered structure, for example, of the visual system and other things. And I go really to very basic uh, assumptions of, maybe it's a little bit pretentious, but what is really life all about? I'm, I'm here in a life science institute and asking this question is kind of uh, odd, but uh, usually when we think about uh, life, the, the kind of questions, that, the kind of answers you get in school, or I guess even here in uh, the academia is, first of all, 42. <laughs> 42, yeah. Not, what, not, not, not what, what is the meaning of life, but what is life? And uh, usually, uh, we immediately are referred to some sort of metabolic exchange. I mean, uh, there's some sort of energy and uh, matter flow between an organism and its environment in some sense, and this is really something the focus, was, the focus of much of 
the work in biology, I suppose, <laughs> how is this uh, metabolic exchange actually work? So, for example, something like photosynthesis or, or things like this. I mean, so uh, some sort of exchange of energy with the environment. And the other, usually as essential part of the definition of life, is what we call self replication or uh, the ability to reproduce. Uh, this, by the way, is a picture taken from a, a more or less recent paper in PNAS uh, uh, that actually showed that they can generate self-replication uh, using relatively very simple systems. I mean, it's, a, it's a, some sort of, a, certainly unorganic, but some sort of a chemical environment that generates, replicates some sorts of uh, uh, molecules without anything that we would like to call life. <laughs> Although it's, so essentially even self-replication, and certainly not metabolic exchange or energy of matter, which is true for all physics and chemistry, if you want, uh, even self-replication is not that special. And actually, it's quite intriguing because this is actually related to something else which you usually consider as life, which is some sort of uh, adaptation. Uh, and, and there's a lot of, uh, recent developments in, in, in non-equilibrium thermodynamics, which actually has to do with understanding uh, how, for example, snowflakes evolve and, and many other pattern formation in nature, which, are, which has to do with what we call dissipative driven systems. And essentially, uh, uh, even this, I, I, wouldn't, I, I think that most of you here will not define a snowflake as a living organism. <laughs> So, so this, although it has as high as complicated system as, as you, can, you can imagine in terms of the out of equilibrium, some sort of dissipative exchange of matter with the environment and so on. So what is life? And, and this is, of course, a question many of us have been thinking about and for, for many years. My answer is not only my answer, but I think that the, the focus of, I believe, also biology, but certainly cognitive science and, uh, and to some extent uh, artificial systems, uh, artificial intelligence and artificial life is really about this issue of predictive predictions. So if you really think about it, I know that it is not something you're going to swallow if you didn't hear about it before immediately, but really the essence of what we call life is uh, the ability to exploit the predictability of the environment in some sense. It, the, the ability to, to turn, uh, to actually turn what, what I call moving from a causal system, which is a completely, completely determined by some sort of initial conditions. I mean, like all physical systems, for example, I determine the initial condition of the system, and in principle, its future is completely determined by the laws of physics, like uh, Newton's or Schrodinger's equation, whatever it is. It doesn't matter if it's quantum mechanics or, or classical mechanics, the, the initial conditions determine the future. Whereas there is something which appears like non-causal in, in living organisms. I mean, in some sense, we, they seem to be able to, I can't really tell you what they're going to evolve into without some conditions in the future. I mean, so it's very much like what we call in control, control theory, uh, there's a the forward, backward, wave which takes us from the initial condition forward into the future, and there's the backward flow of information from the goal backward, and actually optimal control is about tailoring these two things together in, in a sense, and, and, and living organisms to some extent really behave as if they know something about the future and are not fully motivated only by the past. Of course, this is some sort of an illusion which I just want to put away right away. It, 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 of course, depends on the time scale of your observations. If you look at uh, show time scales at the order of the life cycle of the organism, then this is basically true. But if we look at very long time scales, what we call evolutionary time scales, then uh, suddenly causality is recovered. Because then we see that actually a lot of what we call knowledge about the future is actually some sort of very long-term learning that is acquired through our genetic uh, material and so many other things. So there's no contradiction with physics here. It's just that life, according to this view, is, is a local phenomenon. It's something which we can observe and well defined only on a relatively short time scales, <laughs> or at the, uh, of the order of our life, lifespan, and, and at, or even or shorter, of course, much shorter, order of our, what I call immediately, the, 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 this perception action cycle, which can be very, very short. But, uh, 
But on that time scale, life doesn't look like causal. It looks as if there's some knowledge about the future that living organisms exploit. So this type of definition, which is really based on this very fundamental observation that living organisms make predictions and their survival depends on it. And I think this picture, which was taken to be on the poster of this uh, workshop, symposium, uh, is really very illuminating in that sense. I mean, the life of these two organisms depend on their ability to make good predictions and better predictions. So now I'm going to take this, or I'm taking this in general uh, in, my, in my research for many years now, taking this principle to be a fundamental principle, or what we call a first principle in the sense of uh, physics, if you want. Sorry, I'm trying to jump slides here. So uh, in my, I, I want to really break down this assumption that, that life depends on making predictions into the the tiniest or the, the most fundamental mathematical aspect that I can formulate, and I, I, so it has nothing to do with biology at this point. So if you want living organisms or systems that can exploit the predictability of the environment for their, their survivability, and I want to make sense of this f funny definition. So uh, if you go, if we look at uh, very si simple systems that actually uh, in some sense depends on predictions. And I, I, I want to, to take it to the really very, very fundamental thing, the most, the simplest possible system that depend on predictions. We, we actually end up with something as stupid as, as this. I mean, this is actually my, one of my favorite examples. I have to refresh it, I suppose, because it's uh, many new, much better models of this cleaning robot by now. But if you think about it, this uh, stupid cleaning robot, it uh, has uh, two ingredients which are essential for any living organism. First one is the ability to have some sensing of the environment. So it has those mechanical pressures, sometimes optical sensors, or even thermal sensors of the environment. And uh, at the same time, it has motion. It has motor commands. It is, it's, it's, it is able to move around. And if you think about it, it, it is actually a very simple implementation of what we later call called uh, the sensing, the fundamental sensing acting cycle. So essentially, this type of devices, which I don't force you to call living things, but actually to some extent, they, according to my definition, they have a little bit of life in it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's actually cycling information. I mean, it's receiving information from the environment and then using it almost immediately in a way which I usually call the met metabolic uh, information processing. So in some sense, it's sense, process act, sense, process act on a very short cycle of uh, order of seconds, okay? And, uh, but it's actually completely defined and quantifiable by the flow of information that it has to and from the environment. And of course, as you can immediately see or, or realize, uh, this, this flow of information is very, very balanced. I mean, the, amount of information it has to receive from the environment and the amount of information it has to use in order to act must be more or less of the same order. There's a little dissipation there. You may lose information. But for example, putting on such a, ro a robot and high definition video camera with the same type of activity is obviously a waste of uh, information. I mean, there's much too, too much there. And just getting rid of all the, the irrelevant information is going to cost too much. So obviously, I need simple enough sensors that are well balanced by really metabolism, metabolism, metabolic exchange, eventually energy. I don't want to waste efforts on bits, sensing bits that I don't really need. So optimal devices, even of this kind, have this very nice balance, actually, between so the complexity of the sensing system and the complexity of the behavior are tailored together. And you can't think about one without the other, by the way. This is, of course, a very important lesson to those who study either perception or behavior. You can't do that, in my view. But uh, so the lesson here, of course, this is a, a nice engineering, if you want, challenge how to really design such systems so that it will be optimal. And what you have to do is, is strictly speaking, balance these two capacities. And that's something we do uh, with all sorts of algorithms. But a, a much more interesting task is something like playing chess. And playing chess cannot be done by uh, simple metabolic information processing. I mean, if you think about it, if I just respond to the last move, and that's all I do, very short time scale, 
I will not get very far in chess, but some players actually can work. But usually you need some sort of plan or some sort of long term. You need to know where you're going. And so there is this dual flow of information. You know where you are now. You know where you want to be. And you need to get back the information from where you want to be. Unfortunately, with chess, by the way, it's not that simple to say where you want to be. I mean, you know that you want to win the game, but there are too many mate positions that you can actually back propagate all of them. And therefore, things like optimal control, which is the theory of precisely this type of, uh, of uh, information flow, is not very good for chess. You need some other heuristics, which are actually very interesting. How do you plan ahead just a few steps ahead and not all the game and still be useful? And this is an entirely different question, which you also study. But anyway, so I, I really want so, so here again, you see that somewhat more complicated task than cleaning my, my apartment uh, already uh, require you to look into, into much larger time scales, both into the past and into the future. And that's where I believe hierarchies come from. So we actually study organisms uh, in, in precisely this way. So we think about them as machines that sense the environment and act. And what their brain is mostly doing is some sort of an efficient encoding of the past sensations such that they're useful for the future actions and behavior. Sounds simple? Actually, it is simple in the sense that we can really tailor these principles back into very simple mathematics, and that's, I'm not, which I'm not going to get into today. But uh, what is important to realize is that if you think about the behavior as some sort of a dynamical process, I mean, so that where X is, let's say, are the, the states of the world at each time, so nearby future and past are very highly constrained by the, simply the dynamics, the laws of physics, the, the fact that the future and past is highly constrained by, by physical laws that, but when I, or when my MATLAB, but whenever, when I start looking further ahead, those constraints are getting more and more diluted, which means that I know less. I know I can say much more about the immediate future, and I know less and less the further down I look, just as I know less and less the further back I look into the past. So just from very, so this, on, on its own, you see that the amount of knowledge in terms of how much I can really specify the future or how much I really know what happened in the past is a nonlinear function of time. It's, it's what, we, what we call in physics sub-extensive function. It's growing in some sense in a nonlinear way. And actually, we know a lot about the mathematical way this, this, is, uh, this is behaving. And uh, now I want to take exactly this principle of this, this dilution of what we call predictive information. I mean, how much it goes, how, how slow it goes when I look further into the future and, and look at my brain uh, or I, at this the same cycle in the brain. Or sense. So again, the argument, this very simplistic top-down argument of the brain, the brain is, is essentially a machine that is more or less made out of two parts, the frontal and dorsal, which are, which are more or less the back part of the dorsal part is more or less processing uh, sensory information, and the frontal part is more or less processing future information. And these two things cycle all the time with each other. And actually, if I take uh, Fuster's uh, pictures even more, more seriously, you see that actually there is really a hierarchy of time scales in terms of this sensing acting. Uh, so there's this very short sensory motor cycle which happens when I, for example, touch this and my muscles immediately respond to it. So there is a very fast flow of, uh, of, of, of tangible information which is immediately translated into motor response, which actually holds my finger here. So this happens on the sensory motor response on order of tens of milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds. And the further, the further back you look from, the, from this uh, roughly fold in, 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 in our cortex back into further down areas, it's not a little true, of course, you see lo longer and longer cycles. And some of them, at least we, human, we humans, have cycles in terms of response to sensations. I mean, the cycle of sensing and acting, which go all the way to minutes, hours, days, months, years, and tens of years, and so on. In some sense, we are thinking today indefinitely into the future and worry about things that were indefinitely into the past. I worry about things that happens from the Big Bang till the end of the universe, as far as I know. So our ability to recycle time 
is really something very dramatic. I mean, and I actually, I believe that this is what makes us human, that we have this ability to, in some sense, in a recursive manner, to recycle the different hierarchies of, of sensation and, and actions. So if we take it a little more quantitatively, so our brain is essentially a machine that is somehow able to compress the observed past into valuable actions. What I mean by valuable actions is, is really depends very much on what, you, what do you consider valuable in the future. So the first question you really want to answer is how much information is there in the past? So everything is governed, and I can co convince you more mathematically, because everything is governed by the amount of information that the past contains about the future. And as I already said, this amount, this information, which we, can, we call predictive information, this is a term which together with Bill Bialik and Ilya Nemenman we coined in the early 2000s, but it's a very natural thing. I mean, how, so how much information there is in the future about the, the, in the past about the future. And as I said, it has this peculiar shape, just leaves town to be very fundamental. So if you think about the x-axis here is the information that I gather from the past using whatever sensory mechanism I have. And this axis is the information, which I call valuable information in the future. Therefore, in anything which you can predict, which is not valuable, usually you can ignore. But what is valuable is actually very much up to you. I mean, you can invest in the thing that you can predict. And that's precisely what we do. Let's say, for example, when you invest in the stock market, you invest in, in, in stock that you believe are going to be valuable and so on. So, but what is really interesting, so this is a mathematical function, which essentially, what is the maximal information about the, about the future that you can uh, gather or can predict at a given value of information or bits that you actually gathered from the past. And what is interesting about this function, I just want to pay, to point, to pay your attention to a few points which actually I, I found very, very fundamental. The first one, there is a finite slope of this curve at the origin. So may, this may look trivial to you or uh, insignificant, but it turns out that this finite slope is associated with a finite level of complexity or some minimal complexity below which you cannot make any prediction. So this is actually interesting. So if you take my definition of life as systems that are able to make predictions or to exploit the predictability of the environment, then there's a minimal complexity of systems that can make it. I mean, so very, very simple organism cannot survive, cannot exist. This is if you want some sort of a the proof of the existence of God, but it's not. So, I mean, you could, uh, you could think about it as, as a, at a given environment, in order to make predictions, there are two conditions that have to be met. One of them is that the environment is sufficiently predictable, which means that there is some sort of regularity in the environment. If it's completely chaotic, I cannot make any predictions in some intuitive sense. So this is what I mean by positive predictive information. It has to be stable enough to make predictions. And the other thing is that my memory or my internal representation of the world has to be sufficiently complex to pass this particular threshold. And we actually make a lot of calculations of really what happened at this threshold of life, if you want. But the other interesting thing about this curve, which again is coming from simple mathematics, and I'm just studying the complexity of a device that is exploiting the predictability of the environment, and you see this suboptimal curve of these red circles there, which essentially correspond to phase transitions in complexity, uh, in some sense the emerges of a new feature in my representation. So I can, with a certain complexity, I can fall, get some information, and then at some point, I become some optimal. There's a bifurcation in this curve, which means the split of curves. And my finite complexity is going to saturate at some point. It cannot, it cannot go any further than some point, unless there's another phase transition, another emergence of some new structures, this new structure in my perception, uh, which is this first red circle. And then there's another one, there's another one. In general, there are infinitely many. There are many, many phase transitions like this, which correspond to a higher and higher complexity of my organism. So now we know, actually, based on work we did really recently, is that those phase transitions not only correspond to hierarchies of perception, they also ex can explain, for example, things like deep learning. I mean, why do we need layers in neural networks 
in order to make better predictions and actually I can really prove to you that the layers of a deep, a good deep learning algorithm really depends on this reorganization of the representation of the, of the past of the, of the, of the, of the, since that's the input itself. So the, you know, from nothing essentially, all I assume is that I need to make predictions. You get some very concrete predictions about both the structure. Of course, deep learning is just a, a toy example of what actually happens in our brain. So this, I argue, is also a good explanation of why layers of neurons appear, for example, in the visual system or many other things. And actually, you have a very concrete prediction. Where are they going to appear and what is going to, represent, to be represented in any one of those layers? So this is nice. But now, if, if you go back to Merav's picture, how much time do I have? OK, so the, I really like those pictures. And I usually show them even when Merav is not here. <laughs> but uh, so. Uh, if you actually look at the right side, I mean, the, the auditory perception, the auditory hierarchy, there's something very clear about audition. For, and I worked on, on speech for many years. Uh, we clearly guess before we hear, in a sense that we first guess the words and then essentially check them if they're actually what we guessed. I mean, and I believe that this is true also for reading, and I believe this is true for vision. So essentially, in, in the auditory domain, despite what Merav said, we really understand that you can't really listen to speech without guessing what I'm saying, and actually guessing is very well. Actually, you know not only, you have some idea not only about the next word, but also about the next sentence and the next paragraph, maybe the rest of the talk as well. So, uh, and actually you're checking. I mean, essentially what you do is guess and check. Essentially, and we are, of course, much better at making hypotheses about the future and then test them. Hypothesis testing is a lot more efficient mechanism than generative uh, bottom-up type of planning. I mean, any generative model really which has to build the picture from the detail is very lousy and very inefficient computationally. So just from a computational perspective, as actually was suggested by Don, John Tostas already in 1990 before the work of Fahisar and others, uh, only from a computational perspective, you already know that something cannot work if you do it bottom up. You have to do it top down because you first guess and this and then sense. So in some sense, our vision, if you want, our perception, visual perception, for example, saying that there is a dog here requires us to guess first what it is and then check that it's actually there. And in order to check that there is a dog there, I need actually to verify very few details like ears, nose, tail, or whatever. And I can miss all the others. So if our perception is really made out of guessing, testing, guessing, testing, what we really need is a good mechanism for generating those, those guesses. So now, since I really don't have much time, I want to, to go back to, to this uh, visual, uh, this is a uh, predictive information thing. So again, I told you, this is a, a curve I want you to take home, more or less, the amount of bits or knowledge that you have about the future or about the past as a function of time is a highly nonlinear thing. Which when I know more about the immediate future, much more than I know about the, the far future. And now I already argue that we efficiently, we, we have a much more efficient usage of our memory if we divide it not according to time, but according to information. Which means I'm allocating the same number of bits to the near future, and then the same number of bits a bit to the next, next step of, of, of my prediction, so on. Essentially, the complexity or the number of memory cells or the complexity of my predictions should scale with the information that I have not with time. Think about it, it makes perfect sense. Two to the number of bits, essentially the number of states that I have to allocate to each time. So this means that I have to allocate, let's say, k bits to this immediate, immediate unit of time, then k bits to the second one, and, and k bits to the next one, which is exactly how much information I have. But, but those bits are going to stretch in time. So I have the same representation in my memory, or in my language, if you want, to these processes, and to these processes, these processes, and so on. Which really means that somehow I must, I am enforced, <laughs> I have no choice of using some sort of an hierarchical representation. And this is also true for, uh, as I said, from if, even if you don't take time. So, which means actually our, our perception of time should be very, in, in order to be more efficient, is actually very tricky. So this is what we call the linear perception of time, which means I divide, so this is some sort of a 
caricature of the future cone. So time goes here, and the age is history, and the Fs are futures. If I actually divide my perception of time in the future in equal units of time, as, as Newton or Einstein told us, I'm going to waste a lot of efforts on things which I don't know. And therefore, my ability to make planning, my prediction, is going to be very, very restricted for the same computational force. But if actually work is what, in what I call the information time, <laughs> or the predictive time, I actually stretch time according to the predictive information, I get a very diluted representation of the future. And for the same effort, for the same computational effort, can cover a lot more options. But notice that in order for this to work, if what I said before about perception, that I first guess and then perceive and then, and, and then check, I have, when I look further into the future, I actually look at coarser and coarser representation of the world. Which means that I need, there's no way I can do without some sort of hierarchy of representations. So I need, in order to represent what happens here, you know, to, and then backtrack as I need for any, any reasonable planning, I need to have some sort of representations of much coarser uh, images, actions, states of the world, and so on. So I need, and of course, I actually argue, this is work done together with uh, Nogo somewhere here, and we, we are even arguing that the, that the language uh, is, represent, is reflecting, our language is reflecting precisely this type of symmetry. I mean, we have words that describe those hierarchies of time skills, which are both hierarchies of actions and hierarchies of perception, and so on and so forth. So in, in a way, I mean, another picture I want to take home with you is that our perception is really some sort of a, what I call time fish eye. In some sense, so we have a very high resolution nearby, in the nearby future and past. And the further we go down into the past or future, as you see, this is day here and night here, if you don't remember nice, it's, uh, it's actually curved, and we actually allocate the same number of bits. And I actually have a, more, a very concrete prediction here that the curvature of this fish eye lens is completely determined by what we call the predictive information. And we know that the predictive information has essentially two typical types of, of, uh, of nature. One of them is logarithmic, which is for very simple worlds. And logarithmic means that this curve is a log curve, which means that those intervals of equal information grow exponentially with time. And, and this uh, actually says that we very, very quickly forget, or very, very quickly can ignore the past. And this directly has to do with and what some people here I know is exponential discounting of rewards, which comes from this logarithmic curve. Actually, much more interesting environments, which are much closer to what we see in real life, is when this curve is not logarithmic, but some sort of a parallel, less than one, something like a square root, let's say. And, and if it's a square root, then again, with the very little mathematics that you need for this, you can see that those equal information intervals actually grow like a polynom of time and grow polynomially, which actually means that we really need to think about the future much more than an exponential decrease. Let me, so, uh, so again, this is a principle that we now employ and apply in equations of planning, in equations of, uh, uh, in order to balance this, uh, this uh, flow of information in sensing and acting. There's a lot of very rich mathematical structure that emerge from it. Just want to show you one picture which actually comes from the work of uh, Noe Jacobi. Uh, so in some sense, I actually argue that this type of hierarchies are following this uh, information curve. There's simply no, no other way. I mean, it's the first principle that really has a very strong prediction, predicting power. Uh, and it doesn't matter really how we call it. it doesn't, but, but the point, let's think about, for example, about this uh, Van Gogh picture, which I, I guess all of you are familiar with, uh, Starry Night. And uh, what actually happens when we see a picture like this in the museum, or when I, when I look at the other side and I see some very blurry image? So what is really attracting us to such an image? And what is really attracting us is the fact that a very crude representation of this image, I've just noticed that something dark here and something maybe interesting here. And this is already ex creating some sort of expectations. And the expectations are driving us to actually get closer. Because say, OK, maybe this is a person. Maybe this is a house. Maybe this is, I don't know what it is. So I'm starting to climb along this, what I call the predictive information curve, and eventually discover more and more details, 
which, if the art is good, are creating more expectations and actually pulling me forward on this hierarchy of information. Actually, we actually even have a much better explanation of it in terms of auditory perception. Uh, and I just uh, show you, you know, sure, I'm sure I, not have, I don't have time for it, but, but for example, we can play the same, the same game with auditory perception as, as we actually did with uh, Elin Elkin and, and Jonathan Rubin, uh, actually following uh, all the work of, by Nachum Wolinowski, that uh, we actually look at what are the cortical neuron in the auditory cortex uh, represent, and it turns out that they really represent some sort of surprise, which means how much I can predict the next tone versus on, on some sort of crude representation of the history. And doing precisely this type of analysis, but, but much more precisely in terms of I really know what the statistics, in exactly the same setting actually that, that Merav was telling you about, it, an oddball paradigm of, of tones, two tones, and they, but of course the context depends on how well you can predict the next tone, which, I mean, the, the surprise depends on how well you can predict the next tone. And what you actually show, without really getting into detail here, is that neuron, neural response of the number of spikes per second of, of the neurons is linearly related to what we call the surprise in this, what we call bottleneck framework, which means assume that you really remember only, only what you need to remember, and you get a very nice curve in terms of neuroscience, at least, that's surprised in terms of log probability or number of bits versus response, spikes per second, explain almost completely uh, the behavior of our cortical auditory cortex. So this is actually really confirming the fact that at that level of the auditory cortex, the brain is mostly doing predictions. And we can actually, let me, uh, this actually turns out to be quite interesting. I mean, so in this information, Curve, we see that most of the neurons are really allocated in a very specific region in this plane, which has to do with uh, all sorts of other things like working memory and awareness and so on. I'm almost done. Let me just tell you, tell you another newer story, which has to do with the work of Eli and uh, Nadav Amir, who is also here. So we started to, to analyze things like the Morris Water Maze. How many of you know about it? I had the name Morris Waterways. Okay, so it's a very popular experimental paradigm in, in, in neuroscience, or in cognitive science, if you want, where you actually put uh, mice in a, in, in a pool. They don't really like to swim, so there is some sort of platform there which is hidden from them, and they are supposed to learn how to find the platform. They don't, the water is, is, is milky, so they don't really see it. But the point is, uh, and actually there are all sorts of uh, visual cues around, those, uh, those, uh, around this pool. So the task is really to eventually orient yourself uh, and know where the, the, what is the direction of the platform. And it turns out that mice, mice are generally good at that. I mean, the, but it takes them several days in general. If you throw them, let's say, two or three times a day into such a pool, it takes them several days to really learn this task. And before, so before learning, they usually have some sort of uh, random uh, swim, if you want, in, in this pool. And after landing, they're supposed to do something like this, swim directly to the pool. And what we wanted to see, if we can describe this in terms of, again, this trade-off between value of information and information, which is essentially the essence of the theory I was telling you about. So we, Information is really a very important part of it, or predictive information, but I, don't want, I can't get into details now. So if you actually look at how those uh, trajectories really look, again, this is courtesy of Nadav and others who, so before landing, the mice really swim mostly around the corner or the, the, the edge of the pool, and uh, after landing, they do something which is not exactly optimal, but uh, on the average of that, um, they, they spend less time at the co and actually search, and, and, and sometimes they, they really get there faster, and I apologize for Nadal for not drawing the, the latest figures here. But uh, uh, this is a, a way that at least I like to, sit, to think about it, also out of date, but never mind that. Eh? So you can think about those flows in terms of vector fields. So essentially, in every point in the pool, what is the, the most likely direction of swim? Of course, a, there are many issues of how to estimate these things, but which I don't want to get into. So this is more or less how those vector fields look uh, before the learning. And this is how they more or less, so it's not true, but never mind, it looks nice. It's more or less how they look after learning. And if you notice, 
Of course, the after learning is a lot more organized, but it's, it's actually organized in a, in a way which is interesting. It's not necessarily the straight way to the, to the target, but some sort of a simple way. I mean, they try to find the, the right azimuth first, and then they swim to the pool, which is an interesting surprise. And now you can actually plot this in terms of uh, value future information trade-off, and this is, so this is, a, again, it's a temporary until Nadav comes with a better figure, but it's, it's more or less uh, what we like to show here. So if you look at these two, two, two curvature here, there's a, a value in terms of how fast you get into the, into, uh, to the platform versus how much information you need in order to get there. And if you think about it, there are, there are a certain number of bits that you really need Let's say that this uh, poor mouse has to, to ask me <laughs> for directions, just like happened to many of you when you navigate without uh, a GPS navigator. <laughs> I mean, should I turn right or left here? And essentially, you can think about it in terms of what is the minimum number of yes-no questions that you need in order to get home or something like this. And so this is the minimal information that you really need in order to navigate. And the mouse has the same, essentially the same type of problem. What is the minimal number of bits that I need in order to get to the platform? which has to do, of course, with how well you sense the, the walls and, and see the, the cues on the wall and so on. So again, there's this, fundamentally, there's this trade-off of sensing inf sensory information versus actions. And uh, so what we see here, it's a, it's a bit complicated. There's some sort of a theoretical bound, which is not very interesting here, because the task is very easy. But if you look at the, the, the points are real mouse, real mice that actually uh, and, and it's more or less sorted according to times of trials. I mean, how many? So blue are very early trials, and red are very late trials. And you see something, although it's not entirely obvious because there's a lot of noise here, but you see that the early trials have both low value and little information. And then when they get better, they actually jump very quickly to almost perfect but very high information things. But then they keep on improving in terms of compressing their information further, which means that they actually look to uh, achieve shorter or simpler and simpler behavior, which has actually to do, I believe, with uh, what Merav called skill acquisition. But essentially, you do things not, you don't, don't that reach the target, you do it more elegantly and, and in a simple way. And actually, you really see this trend that you first get, but then you learn how to do it very quickly from different places. And then, as I said, I mean, the, the, the ultimate strategy of the mice is not to, to swim directly to the target, but to orient yourself first and then swim. Uh, first, to first, you go to the diameter that really connects those two uh, along the, the hand. And from, so it's a very much like the way some of us navigate in the desert, I mean, in the light at night, more or less get to the right azimuth first and then take a straight walk <laughs> to, the, to the target. Pilots, I suppose, do this also. <laughs> so, so in some sense, uh, this is a very natural thing. OK, so let me more or less finish here. I mean, as I said, this type of paradigm of exploiting predictive information has many other uh, interesting consequences so, on, in which, which we are still exploring. But I think I just want to thank, and I apologize for not mentioning the students here, but those are the, the senior people who worked with me on these ideas over the past few years. All right, thank you very much. Questions? Hello. Charlie? Yeah. You mentioned that uh, too simple life form cannot exist. That's right. I mean, this is a prediction of the theory. How about, how about one DNA molecule or one uh, amoeba? Can it exist? Amoeba is a lot, it's much more than a DNA molecule, okay. and, uh, or even a virus if you want. But, well, so it's, 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 of course they can exist. But virus, for example, depends. And actually, it's a parasite in the sense that it depends on the existence of much more sophisticated creatures. So in some sense, it, it's not fair. <laughs> I mean, he's using, he's simpl simplifying, his, his, this, he's exploiting the, the sensory system and the, and the metabolic system of another creature. <laughs> uh, but, but what I'm saying is, is that on a much, more, a much, simpl much simpler level, before DNA and RNA, what would be really what you can call the onset of life? <laughs> in the sense of what is the minimal complexity that you need in order to be able to go beyond this, what I call the predictability threshold. And it's just a mathematical fact. I'm not trying to give it a, a biological interpretation at this point. There is a minimal complexity below which you cannot make predictions. Now, what does it mean in terms of uh, actual life, actual real biological environment? It's up to you. But the fact that there is such a threshold is interesting. So, I mean, 
Right? Yes, absolutely. So, so how did he do it without a brain? No, no. Well, well, Amoeba has a brain. I mean, it has, it has a brain in the sense that it has sensing, acting, and memory. That's all I need. I mean, whatever you want to call it. It's not a brain in the neural, no, so neural system sense that we want. I agree with you about this. OK. This no, even, I, I even say that our cleaning robot has a, a brain to some extent. <laughs> this is a different talk. <laughs> OK. More questions? Yes. Uh, models of uh, sets and response often use sort of an impulse response, uh, a Z transform, a tap delay line, or whatever which are always of equal units of time in the past by the model's definition. <coughs> are you quite also suggesting that maybe you need a model that allows for, uh, in effect, aggregating times going back in history of different nonlinear quantities? Yes, but, but uh, so I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to. Of course, when the events come, you, you act linearly in time. But the point is that when you think or when you plan into the future, or, or when you remember the past, uh, there's some sort of compression of time. And this compression of time is actually essential. We can't, it, it will be very inefficient to work with equal time. Let's say that you are planning a, a tour, a month's tour, saying where are you going to be at 4 PM and the last day of your tour is overfitting, as we call it. In, 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 you should leave some freedom there. <laughs> OK. Yeah. No, OK. Well, there are some points which are important. <laughs> and some, it's not uniformly spread, of course. There are points which are more important than others. But in general, leaving uncertainty. I mean, if, if the, under uncertainty, you, you don't want to, you want to make your plans more and more coarse when you look further in time. And the point is that there is a nice way of doing it. So actually, and that's one of my tasks in, in, in life right now, is to try to reformulate the planning equations, which are known in control as the Bellman equations, in exactly that way, such that the states are not equal states, but the coarser and coarser states when you look further. I, I, I actually argue, I think I can even prove that, that this is a much more efficient planning in terms of the number, the uncertainty that you're going to cover. This was a part of the talk I didn't give last week. Last week. But uh, anyway, so we can. Uh, uh, working on, under uncertainty has a, has a cost, and the cost is really this coarsening of perception and, and behavior. And uh, uh, so I'm not exactly sure if I'm answering your question because I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to. But. So I suggest we continue the discussion. Okay, thank you very much.